First up, we are privileged to have Philip Rose from Coffee CNC, um, our hardware partner. And um, so, Philip, talking about uh, hardware with Archie Polish. Cool. All right, well, um, first things first, uh, you got a brochure on the tables, um, just like last year, we're running the conference again in September. Um, obviously, we prefer for uh, people to come and talk to that. Uh, talk at that, and uh, again, anyone who actually comes to and is selected as a speaker, uh, Hex will cover your costs for that. So, we we'll want, some, want some really weird, wacky things, and I'll do a quick presentation on that after I do the hardware, because uh, the area that we're doing it, we actually have a lot of water. So, I'm thinking, you know, subs, boats, things like that as well. Um, love to see a hybrid flying boat thing you know, like beach hole off water and all that sort of stuff, that would be sort of cool. So if anyone's got anything or knows someone who's working on anything cool like that, they're, they're the sort of things that would like something different. Um, and obviously, um, you know, just any any chat that um, helps out with uh, RG Pilot. So um, yeah, just obviously uh, by now, if you don't know what a Pixel 2 uh, cube is, um, then you're probably not in this room. Um, so, uh, you're all familiar with Cube Black. I think most people in this room have probably flown a Cube Black, so probably don't need to go on too much about that. But um, um, obviously, the Tibios are uh, coming. What was going to be a product that we were sort of looking for, what are we going to do next, is all of a sudden a product that's got a huge amount of resources there that are unused, um, which is really cool. So. Um, along with like Pixel 1, the Pixel 2 have a massive life extension thanks to Sid and Troops with their work on that. Um, so obviously from a hardware point of view, really appreciate that. And the, the benefit of that for people that have them is th this is well proven technology now. It's, it's reliable, it's trusted and not having to move on to the next generation for any particular reason is, is a good thing. Um, that being said, sometimes you do need different hardware for particular applications. Um, 3DR Solo um, obviously has a well-known issue with ESCs. Um, it's not the only vehicle out there that actually has ESC issues. Um, quite a few ESCs uh, don't cope very well with 3.3 volt signaling. And um, so you can actually, uh, due to ground lift and due to other, uh, other things that happen to the ESC, when you throttle up, your ESC can decide that it's not going to run anymore, um, especially on a quadcopter, that um, is not helpful. So, we, we did a uh, version of the cube called the Green Cube. Uh, it's exactly the same as a black cube, it's got a solar jumper there. If you've got a black cube, you can turn it into a green cube. They're, they're exactly the same. It's just we pre cut it, solder it, and put it in a green cube so you know it's different. And by green cube nowadays, we just put a sticker on it actually. So uh, it's exactly the same, uh, exact same thing. So, um, <coughs> but it means your solo can run master. And if you're running other vehicles, there's other companies that actually go with the green cube, which I'll go into later. Um, one of those companies is sitting here in this room. Um, and they use that in a completely different aircraft because of that extra safety margin that that um, output gives on all the, all of the servos and um, ESCs. So, um, now that Chibios is out, um, we probably don't need this anymore because you guys are just wonderful at fixing things in software. <laughs> so, um, there's no need for double the RAM and double the speed and all that sort of stuff. So, <laughs> what, sorry, what's that? Not so fast. What's that? Not so fast. Not so fast? <laughs> You'd like that? <laughs> um, so, you know, I was really looking forward to when we get the Cube Red actually running you know, three or four EKFs in parallel and doing all of this really cool stuff that this new hardware was going to bring to us. And um, thank you, Sid and Trish, we can do that now on the Cube Black. Um, but thanks to Michael, he wants to use up all of the, um, the, the extra <laughs> facilities on scripting, so um, we're still looking forward to the Cube Red and uh, all of its extra features it's going to bring. Um, but what I do want to emphasize to people is when this is released, this is a new hardware configuration. It's, it's going to have new features. It's not for people that want tried, true, and reliable. 
it is going to be beta, it's going to be new, it's going to be running new code, new everything. Um, if you've got commercial products and you're flying half a million dollar cameras, uh, I want you on the black. I don't want you playing with the red. Uh, whereas if you're yeah. building stuff that is just really cool and you're enjoying yourself, then yeah, definitely want you on that. Forever or initially? Initially, you know, right. first first year or so, maybe maybe two. I mean, it, it took us on Pixel One. It took us a while to get to that point where you're willing to fly a red Epic camera underneath or something like that. Um, and if you're flying a, a solo, well, you know, the sooner we get that on the red, the cooler it will be. But uh, it really depends on what the vehicle is. But from from a commercial aspect, we have a lot of OEMs using the um, the black. I don't want people feeling that there's some urgency to move to the red because thanks to the chip of Tibios and SID, that, that urgency is actually being taken away, which is nice from a hardware point of view because we, it just takes the pressure off. So, um, so we've actually got four different versions of the cube now. We actually have a cube blue as well. Um, which will eventually hit the market, which is basically um, just without the vibration isolation. Um, the, the benefit of that is if you've got uh, smaller vehicles, you still want the quality of the, um, of the cube, but you don't need that extra isolation. So things like rovers and things like that, um, where you don't necessarily care, and one I use plenty because you're already on the ground. Um, yeah, so that will eventually come out. I've been talking about that one for a while, and we will get there. Um, but the, the advantage of this infrastructure is um, from, a, from a carrier board and to an autopilot point of view, if you've already designed your hardware, especially from a commercial point of view, if you've designed a carrier board that's custom for the, the cube, when we come out with the red, it's just pull them out, hope they'll like it, and you're ready to go um, once the cube is running. Um, so that gives a, a path forward that um, I hope gives OEMs a lot of um, confidence in designing their products and designing it around Archipelag, knowing that the hardware is not going to be made out of date at a particular time. <coughs> so, um, yeah, at the moment we have the full carrier board. This is sort of the, the standard thing you get when you buy a uh, Pixel 2. Um, this board gives you access to most of the practical I.O. that's on the, on the board. If you, um, you know, the, the Cube Red has three CAN bus, whereas the standard um, full carrier board only has two, so really that's that's the only outward facing thing that the full carrier board is not going to be good enough for if you want to go for a full CAN bus infrastructure. Um, so we, we do plan on having a, uh, a CAN only carrier board coming out at some time, which would be really nice for smaller frames because well, there's just no need for any other bugs once we get the uh, Accessory infrastructure finished. Um, looking at you, Sebo. Um, so next things next, we've got uh, what? <laughs> black on black. <laughs> black on black. Yeah, that looks really good on my screen here. Um, sorry about that. Look, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, we have the here too. It's not black on black. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's got little white bits. It's all good. Um, <laughs> So we uh, the here too. If you can see it, looks like a here. Um, the difference being it's CAN bus. Um, so just because CAN bus is something we've talked about for so long, so many people know that it exists. So many people know we're working towards it, but we don't really have much out there in the way of giving confidence to people that CAN bus is as wonderful as it is. Uh, what we've actually done on this is, when it is released, you plug it in, you'll plug it into the serial port like you would normally. It's a serial port I2C Compass GPS. Um, when you're confident that you want to start playing with CAN, there's a switch on the back, you can flick that, use a different cable, plug it into the CAN port, and you've got a CAN GPS. So, unlike some of the other hardware that some of the developers have sitting on their desks that are lovely paperweights because there's no code for them, uh, this will work out of the box as a standard GPS um, ready for the future. It has a uh, it has a gyro, Excel, magnetometer, and barrow built on standard. It also has um, the Profi LED LEDs, so they're individually controllable LEDs, um, software dependent. Uh -huh. 
obviously. And so that, that gives quite a little bit, of, uh, quite a bit of flexibility for the future on um, distributed IMUs and potentially actually, um, if Paul can get an EKF small enough, running some form of checking um, and consistency checking on the GPS versus the IMUs uh, on that to actually determine whether that data makes sense before we actually waste time on it in the, uh, in the uh, CPU. So also if you are running a Linux board, for example, if it's got CAN bus, um, plug this into a, uh, into a TX2, for example, and um, you, know, you can do some cool stuff without having to actually have extra gear on board. So that's the first GPS that could actually fly the aircraft itself. Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Remove the flight controller completely, just the cables. And that's yeah. correct. Especially when you realise this solo also has CAN ESCs on board. Um, so uh, it would be a pretty clunky flight controller if you just skip to that due to the fact that they're all little F3s. Um, so yeah, I'm not quite sure our code is quite that compact yet. See, work on it. How much flash? It's not. <laughs> not on this one. <laughs> I don't think you will even fit open pilot on that. How much, how much flash is? Uh, how much flash on that? Map? 64. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a bit, that's a bit slim. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> um, yeah, so <clears throat> moving on to that, I can't remember what my next. Uh, there we go. Can fly. I'm turning this over. Uh, we have the CAN optical flow board sitting on the bottom here. Um, so, you know, pictures never quite tell the, uh, the size of the thing, so having real things sort of cool. Um, that bit, which is easier to point out there, that's actually a, a little lighter. Um, this original version is pretty crappy, but the uh, new version that SP just released um, gives us about four and a half metres indoors of um, LiDAR range. Outdoors, you might get a metre and a half or thereabouts, but what the, the best thing that's going to give us is some um, assistance on landing um, and just getting, when we when we go over a point, giving us a new reference to start from. Um, the work Trudge has been doing on the um, on the Sky Viper sort of takes away the need for the LiDAR in many applications for the run. Still watch it. Yeah. yeah. You, still, you still like it, but if you can't afford one, at least at this point, you're going to have something at a relatively cheap price without having to put a $300 LiDAR or $200 LiDAR on there. You'll be able to start. If you really want precision navigation on optical flow at a higher altitude, you'll still need a LiDAR, a external LiDAR with this, but it'll get you started. Um, yeah, so uh, the, other, the other devices we've got coming on Canvas, uh, we've got a can uh, SB sensor, uh, which also has a mag on it. Uh, many in the dev team keep picking on me because they simply put mags on everything. Uh, Paul wants to get rid of magnetometers if he possibly can, and I keep adding them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there, it, it also has a, uh, like it's all at ICM 20948, so it's a 9 DOF IMU that's actually on the airspeed sensor. Um, so there's no shortage of IMUs in this environment, and the reason that we've picked that ship is it's got the compass, which was um, requested by um, a particular company who's sitting up there, which I'll go into shortly. Um, they want a compass on that because they want their compass as far away as possible from any electrical noise or anything like that. They don't want it where they put their GPS. Um, so the SV sensor made sense because it's just tucked right out of the way. And being on CAN bus, we don't care about how long the cable is and all that sort of stuff. So um, it sort of makes sense to have a compass there, even though we've already got one on the GPS. Um, so one of the things that will have to happen within the infrastructure is, I've got 52 compasses on this aircraft, which one do I actually want to use and, and deciding um, how to use that. So that's a challenge for um, the future. And then um, another thing which uh, I was talking about at the develop conference last year that um, didn't exist, um, finally at this conference I get to hold it in my hand for the first time, and that's the ultra-wideband uh, indoor positioning system on CAN bus, um, dual CAN bus, um, so we can have redundancy on that. 
It's got a F427 processor on it, so that's the same processor that's in the Q Black. Um, there is no shortage of processing power on this one, um, and I think Jonathan's still trying to use it, although isn't he? Yeah. yeah. He'll pick it up. <laughs> so, um, so that uh, for those that don't know what QWB is, uh, it's an ultra wideband radio transceiver, and we use that with some pretty clever uh, maths to do indoor positioning, or in the case of, um, of the company that's sponsoring this, which is Matternet, um, they are doing precise outdoor positioning in areas where GPS may or may not be trustworthy. So if you're landing between buildings, for example, um, you may get too much multi-pathing, so that they can um, put multiple ones of these around your landing station and therefore get nice precision landing, even if the GPS is bad. Um, the reason that they've gone for UWB over radar, or, well, not so much radar, but over visual and stuff like that, is due to you can't control the environment. It could be night, it could be smoky, it could be foggy, um, and there's there's different reasons why each of those technologies doesn't quite work well. What's that, what accuracy are they getting? Um, it's, ten centimeters. It's about that's the yeah, uh, about ten centimeters. Ten centimeters is the yeah. 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 You, I think the laws of physics mean that it can't get much below 10 centimetres, but okay. what's that? I guess we'd have to use the phase like GPS does if it's trying to get less than that. Well, it's actually using the phase to do that. Um, okay. Brief thing on ultra wideband, basically you've got multiple frequencies and it's using the, the difference in the phases of the different frequencies to, okay. to work out exactly where in that, um, in that signal that it actually is. And by using those multiple bands, you get a much more precise thing, but 10 centimetres is sort of where it's at. Um, there are ways of getting better, but not with that, um, and not at this sort of price. So, uh, the price of that yet to be announced, but it, it might be ridiculous. 10 centimetres is okay. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, to, to, to put it in perspective, that's 10 centimetres there. If, if you need landing more precisely than that, then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, it's not that far, so, yeah. Um, and then the, the next CAN device that we, uh, we have, if this is going to actually run, I apologise for this video, this computer is terrible. There you go, that's as fast as this computer can run that video. I think it's due for an update. Um, so that's uh, this solar flying uh, CAN bus. Um, Oh, fly away. <laughs> well, that's <Next> one. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's this uh, flying CAN, UAV, uh, so UAV CAN, and um, all of the CAN devices that we're doing with uh, with Jonathan and Sid, um, we're doing under the open overdrive um, thing, so everything is is public already. All the, all the drawings are public, um, PSC drawings are public, um, this is the one time where I'm actually doing the opposite of what I normally do. I normally hate it when people directly copy my stuff. I want people to copy this because we need CAN to succeed. And at the moment, um, we've done a lot of work getting stuff done, but we need people to actually start building this. So we're encouraging people like T-Motor and stuff like that to get on board and, and do it. Um, t is pretty keen to get involved, which is, which is cool. Um, so hopefully, with it, especially with the FOC, getting motors matched and all that's a little bit uh, messy and complicated, so having uh, hardware partners like that getting on board is, is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so that's the um, that's sort of the can uh, side of things. Um, and the next one uh, is something that we worked on with uh, eLab, um, and eLab have uh, already built some prototypes of this. Um, uh, I've seen the bare boards, I haven't actually seen a populated board of this, but uh, it seems like it's running, but uh, we have a mini carrier board, which a lot of people have been asking for is just something a little bit smaller to um, fit in smaller models. Um, we started looking at this and trying to decide what to include on a small carrier board, and we decided that everything was still the way to go. Um, so we really haven't missed much. Um, we've got the, the dual um, power inputs at the top, um, we've got uh, four serial ports, we've got one CAN port, um, we've still got the full uh, GPS port, um, and we've got 
uh, one extra I2C still there, so it's still working around the current inf infrastructure. Obviously, once we, you know, if we succeed at moving to this sort of full CAN infrastructure, this will be able to be much smaller because we'll only need three plugs on it. Um, but that's where we're at at the moment. Um, so you have your normal 8 PWM and your RC in on the, the headers there, and this header in the corner here, each of them is one of the IO, um, and sorry, the FMU um, PWM pins um, individually um, set out. So you can use them for encoders or whatever you want to do. So for a rover, um, it's, it's quite nicely set up. Um, yeah, and there will be more to say on that one later down the track because we're working on something else with uh, eLab that will be sort of aimed at the rover side of things as well. So that's next year's or later. Um, Co-computing. We had an interesting thing happen last year um, where we, we did this massive push with Intel Edison and uh, as many of you will know, we have this lovely uh, board that has a nice plug on the bottom for an Intel Edison and it's really exciting. Unfortunately, Intel uh, reprioritized and the Edison and the Jewel are no longer available, which is sad, but you know, the Edison was good for things like what Michael's managed to put on with Chibios and do a bit of scripting and things like that. So, you know, it might be a little unnecessary there, but when it comes to video and stuff like that, it, it just wasn't it wasn't in the run. Um, so it wasn't really enough power anyway. So people that were doing co-computing were pretending to use Text 2, you know, Raspberry Pi, and Android, um, or the IMX6. Um, so what we're actually doing, we're partnering with a company to make some modules that actually plug into the Edison port that are an IMX6, so we should actually be able to run full open solo or you know, AP sync or whatever on um, that full carry board with Edison. So the Edison board is coming back in stock um, so that people can actually um, buy that if they want to in preparation for that. Um, so that, that will be a, the first one will be an IMX6 solo, um, which is ironically what's in the solo. Um, and uh, we, we thought we'd go with that one first, even though it's not the best in the range, um, because we've got code that works. So I uh, figure that's the best place to start. Uh, then we'll probably do an IMX6 uh, quad core um, of that so that we can lift the performance of all of that. Um, We'll skip the IMX7 because it's the IMX7 is a little bit deceptive in its naming. The IMX7 is actually a low power version of the IMX6. It's actually not as good as the IMX6. So um, unless of course your goal is really low power devices, in which case it's way better. But for what we want to do, video transmission and general computing, it, it offers nothing to us. The IMX8 on the other hand is far better. It's got better graphics capabilities, it's got better GPU. Um, so. That's sort of in the works at the moment, but um, to start with, we'll stick with the IMX6. Um, so I thought I'd show you a couple of things where people have uh, used the cube in their own um, carrier boards. We've got, we've got heaps of these. I think we're, we're up to about 50 or 60, somewhere around there, um, custom carrier boards of various companies around the world. Um, that are doing things, and many of you would have seen this um, piece to hear that um, Spectreworks did. Um, plug in a cube and it just it does power distribution and everything. If you've got an X8 or a, um, a quad, it's it's just so plug and play, it's really nice. So um, if you haven't seen that and you're interested in a carry board that just does a little bit more, definitely encourage you to look at that one. Um, so, um, where are we? There's obviously other places where you can stick a uh, Pixel 2, um, whether you want to put a black or a green in there, that's another matter. Should have put a green in that one for the photo, but anyway. Um, there's actually an iris carry board floating around that um, we are still considering whether we'll make or not, because there's still people flying irises, loving irises, and wanting to keep them flying, but they won't update them. Um, that carry board's pretty cool, because uh, it's just so neat, the installation, there's no wires everywhere. It just presents better. If you're turning up to a company, um, you, you know, you've done a lightweight version, so you don't want all the unnecessary covers and things on it, something like that looks a lot better than your typical rat's nest of wires that you tend to get when you use the full carrier boards. So, um, obviously, a great platform, and, and all, of, all of the original testing for the 
Pixel 2, and obviously the, the original Pixel 2 um, was in this, so it's fully upgradable and you'll be able to get the RAM in that as well. Um, and I just want to throw this one in here um, because it's an awesome aeroplane and an awesome company, and Michael does awesome work with Azure Pilot, so well, thank you, and uh, thanks for putting the cube in there, it's pretty cool. Um, and this is the example of a green cube in a non-solar where using that extra that extra um, buffer on the servos is, and the ESC, it's just, it's just worth it. Um, so uh, that's, that's the other thing I didn't mention about the cube red. It's on the top, exactly. Yeah. What's that black thing on the top? The green bell GPS center. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's mounting one of the Septon Trio GPS boards directly to the bottom of the carrier board. Okay. So from the custom carrier board for us that we can mount the expensive GPS directly without having to have a wiring moving yep. out to it. It's been convenient. I couldn't hear that. What is, it? What is that black thing? GPS antenna, a three hundred dollar GPS antenna. Oh right. <laughs> to go with the how many thousand G dollar GPS? Two to <laughs> seven, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, and so the reason they've gone green is to get that five volt output. So the other thing we've done on the cube red, the five volt output will actually be software selectable. So you'll be able to actually decide whether or not you want three point three or five volt. There are some ESCs and servos, unfortunately, out there that will burn up if you put 5 volts through them. Um, so we can't just switch back to 5 volts. Um, the, the world has moved past 5 volts, um, and everything's 3.3 or 1.6 volts nowadays. Um, so we can't just do a general, yeah, everything's going to be 5 volts. We're, we're stuck with having to have 3, um, but there are applications where you want to. So having that software switchable is... Um, yeah. Could we do something like 3.8, you know, just a bit more room without... You know, yeah, unfortunately the process is like to operate it. I know, three or level shifters or something. I don't yeah, know it's, yeah it, um, it, it's one of those things where you sort of don't get too many choices um, because the devices are either designed for this or this or this. Um, it's, it's a cube dark grid. What's the estimated uh, 3.3 uh, 3. 3 or oh, uh, What ones catch fire, you need it uh, 5 volts. Yeah. Uh, many of the cheap ones that you'll buy on Banggood, etc. Um, and unfortunately, the reality is that um, that that's the market that we're in. So it's the uh, signal level of the power level, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the power level there. Yeah, yeah. All sort of expecting. I mean, many of them are up to what seven point two and thereabouts to take two S, but the signal level they're expecting three point three, and some processes just aren't tolerant. So, yeah. um, anyway, so. So that's that, um, and the other thing I just wanted to briefly go over, um, some of you actually managed to come over to China and visit us last year. We had a conference um, in Xiamen, um, which was really cool. We, we've got a few of our Chinese speakers here, Yanni and Sid and uh, Michael and Seppo somewhere here. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that was, that was uh, pretty cool. Pickies of them. Um, and yeah, we had Jonathan, which I, unfortunately Jonathan wasn't able to come this week, which was quite disappointing when she was here. But uh, yeah, so we had um, a incredible attendance. We had uh, nearly 500 people turn up. Um, some of them were, you know, media, because this thing was sort of something new. Um, but many of them were people who were genuinely using it, whether they're university students or lecturers or things like that, there's a lot of people using Argypilot. There's a lot more using something else we're all familiar with, but there's a lot of people using Argypilot and, and you know, we're really putting a push in China to encourage them to um, use Argypilot, become part of the community, become partners. Um, we just had a, another Chinese company join up as a partner just recently who attended this and who, uh, visited their uh, facilities a few times and encouraged them to join. Um, as partners, that's Thunder, uh, Thunder Tiger. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, next, or oh, next year, this year, it is 2018, isn't it? Yeah, cool. Uh, <laughs> so this year, we're not holding it uh, in Chowing. Um, it was a lovely location, but we're not allowed to fly there, which is a bit of a problem for a UAB conference. Um, it's too close to the airport, it's just, yeah, it was just too complicated to fly down, unfortunately. And that happened, that 
we, we got that information like the day that the conflict was starting, we got told, no, nah, no flying at the site. Um, so that was a little frustrating. Um, so we've been working uh, with the Shuzo um, regional governments, um, and they've basically allocated us a 12 uh, square kilometre flying area over lakes and ponds. Um, so it's a bit hard to tell, but this area here is our um, is a runway, um, and everything over the river there is our flying area. Um, so there's new custom facilities being built to basically become a training facility slash runway flying area. So that's all undercover, um, but that's all glass. So you can be warm when you're flying. And glass roof, glass front. Um, that's all, um, and then we've got a, a nice big runway down the end. Um, I'm not sure what that little thing at the end there is. Oh yeah, that's right, the runway's in between. So it's a little bit tight in space um, on that area, but um, now that we're all VTOL and stuff, that doesn't matter. Um, the actual area, so that gives you an idea of the, uh, the flying zone. Um, it's, it's a massive area with some really cool lakes. Not, it's not just one big lake, they're, they're all separate little islands and stuff like that. Um, so being able to fly through that area unrestricted is going to be sort of pretty cool. That's yeah, Great survey opportunities. Great survey opportunities and, and also thinking, you know, boats and things like that as well. Um, so this year it's just going to be a conference, but the next year they'd like to actually um, introduce some level of competition of some sort. Um, sort of a little bit OBC style, but not quite as formal. Um, and basically we, we want people to turn up with stuff and surprise people rather than um, months of letting people know and stuff like that, so. Um, well, we will be able to fly this year as well? Yeah, we'll be able to fly this year. We'll be able to, um, yeah, so we've got, we got full flight permission for that whole area. Um, um, yeah, so the conference, last last year the conference was basically a one-day conference. Um, it was very cramped. Um, Yo, so just to be clear, uh, where you're showing there's not what the conference is, it's, it's another area that's been allocated. The conference is um, at this same location. Yeah, yeah, so the flying in the conference is the same location. Um, so yeah, last year we had um, a one-day event and I think, yeah, it was it was pretty cramped um, trying to get everything in um, in that time. There were a lot of people. It was really novel having all these developers there, and everyone wanted one on ones with everyone. So I think for the developers, it was really exhausting. Yeah, um, I know for me it was. I think for the rest of it, it was pretty exhausting, wasn't it? Um, so this year we sort of want to break that up a bit more. So it's actually going to be a three day conference um, with you know more afternoon activities and uh, a, bit, a bit more similar to what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, and also by the time you fly all the way over there, you don't sort of want to fly there, fly back quick. So, um, yeah, really keen to get people to have a look, um, get in contact with myself, get in contact with Gene. Um, that's a terrible slide, but you've got the same thing on the poster in front of you. <laughs> and, yeah, anyone who has some, I'm really looking for something that is different from what we've already done, so you know, I don't want to hear about cube reds there, I don't know if it's in my hands, so you know, um, something new would be good. Anyone? That's it? And this is in addition to the other one, right? Well, this is a continuation of last year. Um, yeah, so uh, last year we had the conference there, it was planned as an annual conference, it will continue as an annual conference. Um, there are always going to be other people that run conferences. I think that well, yeah, this is an Ardipolis specific conference, whereas the Shenzhen is a, an industry conference where Ardipolis has a big piece, I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this is this is just Ardipolis. Yeah. Well, how many attended last year? About 500. So, yeah. Was, uh, for a first conference, I, like, you saw them 500, and I'm like, mm. And then we got there, and yeah, it was packed. It was, it was really cool. So. Well, they've done much. Yeah, it was, we had, we had uh, I think it was 540 people um, all up turned up, so it was, it was pretty good. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Of course, we should, uh, that sounds great. Uh, 
the um, of course, like we talked about uh, yesterday a little bit, um, we should probably measure our success by uh, the outcome of those conferences, not so much by the number of people, but by how many new developers we get in and or new companies or new partners, that kind of thing. Mentioned we are. Sorry, offhand comment. I suppose, I suppose it comes to any conference, so yeah. we need to make sure we have uh, good responses, but at the same time, we've got uh, partners that are willing to actually do that. We need to, uh, need to encourage that and uh, yeah, support that, so that's cool. All right, any hardware questions? Cool. Um, sorry, I have a question. Um, so there's so many great uh, sensors like the flow sensor. I mean, that's yeah. just wonderful. Yeah. Um, are those going to show up in the you know hex store or, uh, or the you know partner stores or when are those going to show up? Um, yeah, look at the moment we're doing the second round of hardware of those. The first round of hardware we found some issues. It was um, the CAN was interfering with GPS, which was a bit of a problem, especially on a CAN GPS. Um, so we uh, we went back to the drawing board and fixed that problem. Um, so that's all fixed now. We're doing the second round of them now. In fact, that's the second round one here, and all the appropriate devs that are working on that, including yourself, yep, I got one of them. Yep. Um, so getting that one up and running, um, that, that's going to be the, the first one out because it is usable even without can. So we're going to get that one out there and, and prove it. Um, we don't want to get them all out in one hit, just in case you know there is some fundamental thing that doesn't work because there is a lot of duplicated design in each of the devices. Um, so we've, we've got those ready. With the S speed should be uh, probably late next month. Um, the S speed should be in the hands of developers as well. Um, but it's can only, so you know there, there is no there is no code for it yet. Um, so when the code exists to a point that we're confident enough that the bootload is working properly and it gives some useful information so that general developers can at least have a play with it. We'll let it out at that stage. We won't wait until it's absolutely proven because I think that's one of the problems we have with the ESCs. We've always been waiting for this perfect solution, perfect solution, perfect solution and we're four years down the track and we've only got, you know, I mean a lot of you have paperweights that are ESCs but we don't really have too many people. I know Trudge flies with one of the original ones but like, I don't know if I ask for a show of hands who's flying with can ESCs in this room, I think we're only get trich. So um, really, we want to avoid that. We want to give people hardware that's actually going to be useful. Um, yeah. Now, I know there's been uh, development of this for a while. Uh, and, and the, what's holding back now is, is the drivers and the firmware for the particular hardware trick. Yeah. Yeah. The hardware faster than the drivers are you know, going to build. Yeah. Or not the drivers, but the software in the device that you're making. Yep. Um, so it might be important to note that uh, partners are welcome to sponsor people if they yep. want to uh, bring priority to those. If yep. they have a certain application that yep. they want done first, then they could they, they could, you know, sponsor or, or something to get done. Yep. Um, and, and I mean, we've got, we've got partners like um, RF Design who are doing a lot of work on the CAN uh, side of things. Um, as well, we've got Matternet doing work on the CAN, and obviously uh, DLab who are helping with the CAN. Um, that's that's really critical. What we're lacking is a, like we had this conversation yesterday a bit. Um, we're actually lacking bandwidth in the particular engineers that have those skill sets. Um, so I, I've actually had to knock back some sponsorship from um, from Pierre's company um, because. We actually don't have an engineer that is doing that, who's working on that. Um, so, you know, what, what I look for in an engineer working on CAN is someone who's actually got in and started working on it, doing it, um, and, you know, then look for some sponsorship for them. Um, and at the moment, really, we have Sid and we have Jonathan who are working on it, um, and that's it. So, um, yeah. So you point out that now we're using the same base RTOS on the peripherals, on the CAD yeah. peripherals, as well as on the main one. So, yeah. and we have a book about that RTOS for people to yeah. read. Bringing an engineer up to speed with the basic technology should be a lot easier now than it was last year. Yeah, and also with the work Sid and Jonathan have done, like we, we do have a bootloader now. So, you know, last time I handed uh, hardware to people, like there wasn't even a bootloader on it. Um, and so there wasn't much they could do with it, whereas now we actually have a bootloader that works, so if they want to play with it and 
test things and stuff like that. They don't like anything particularly. Um, so we are at a stage where that becomes more reasonable that someone who wants to give it a go um, would be welcome to, to work on it. I'd like to see some engineers give it a go before I then try and get them sponsorship because I want to know that they can actually give good value for the, um, for the partner as well. Um, yeah. I mean, our partners have been wonderful in, um, in the support they've given us. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's particular companies that we keep highlighting, eLab, 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 um, especially, um, that has just been wonderful. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Ms. Beasley, son. Yeah. Anything else? Cool. Cool.